A difference equation description for a system actually reveals a lot to us about the system characteristics. And the method we've developed for finding the output of a system described by a difference equation gives us a lot of insight. So recall the difference equation is of the form of the sum from k equals 0 to n a k y of n minus k with y being the system output is equal to the sum from k equals 0 to m b k x of n minus k where x is the system input and we're going to assume that a0 is equal to 1. And we've seen that the output of this difference equation y of n for a given input can be expressed as a sum of two terms y sub s of n which represents the steady state response of the system to the input and y sub t of n which represents the transient response of the system to the input. Notice that the steady state response the output of the system behaves in like manner as the input although it gets adjusted by some constant that depends on the input. So we consider the general case of an input taking the form of z to the n where z is a complex number then the output for the steady state response is just h of z, so that's some function of the complex number z, times z to the n. And the function h of z is of the form the sum from k equals 0 to m bk z to the minus k divided by the sum from k equals 0 to m ak z to the minus k. Now the transient response tells us how the system gets from its initial state to the steady state condition and we're going to call that y t of n and we've seen that that can be expressed as a sum from l equals 1 to n of some constant c sub l times d sub l raised to the nth power and the d sub l are the roots of the characteristic equation which is just a sum from k equals 0 to capital n of a k z to the minus k equals 0 now the constant c sub l are chosen so that our total response y of n satisfies the initial conditions. So that's a brief summary of our solution technique for finding the output of the system given the input and a set of initial conditions. Now let's see what this tells us about the behavior of the system. And we're going to start with steady state conditions. And what we mean by a steady state condition is that any initial energy that was stored in the system dissipates or the effect of the system being at rest is overcome. The output in the steady state condition takes the same form as the input and that's an important observation. If I apply an input z to the n then when n gets large my output is just a scaled version of z to the n where h of z is some constant. And that's because the transient response for stable systems needs to go to zero. In other words, any initial energy in the system has to fade away and no longer be, have an effect. For example, if the system input is a complex sinusoid, so in other words, by setting z equal e to the j omega, then z to the n is just e to the j omega n, and this says that my output is h evaluated at e to the j omega times e to the j omega n. So complex sinusoid input, I get a complex sinusoid output, and the amplitude and phase of that sinusoid are scaled by h of e to j omega. Now if I take a real sinusoid as an input, x of n equals cosine omega n, I can write that as a sum of two terms of the form z to the n. I've got one half e to j omega to the nth power plus one half e to the minus j omega to the nth power. And since these systems are linear, the output is the sum of the outputs due to these individual terms and therefore I can write y of n as one half h of e to the j omega times e to the j omega n plus one half h of e to the minus j omega times e to the minus j omega n. Now you can use some properties of the system in that if the coefficients are real and I put a real value input then the output has to be real and that actually tells us that h of e to the j omega satisfies a conjugate symmetry condition it's not important at the moment other than to say that this simplifies to the magnitude of each of e to j omega cosine of omega n plus the arg or the phase of h of e to j omega. So if I put a cosine in I get a cosine out its amplitude and phase may be shifted depending on the characteristics of the system as measured by h of e to j omega. So we know that when we put 
an input into a system, if we let that input continue on indefinitely, eventually the output of the system is going to behave in like manner as the input that we applied. Now the transient response then tells us how the system transitions from its initial state of having either stored energy or being at rest to this steady state behavior. And we know that the form of the transient response is the sum L equals 1 to N C sub L times D sub L raised to the nth power, where these Ds are the roots of the characteristic equation, which we can write in terms of Z inverse or in terms of positive powers of Z. This particular form, recall, holds when D sub L are distinct. In other words, there's no repeated roots. Now the repeated roots case can be handled and doesn't really give us much additional insight beyond what we're going to get here using this distinct roots assumption. So the question for us is if I have some constant D, what does D to the N look like? because that's what each of the terms in Y consists of. And the answer depends on the magnitude of D and whether D is real or complex. If D is real, and we're going to assume that the magnitude of D is less than 1, because if it's greater than 1, then D grows off to infinity. In other words, the transient response doesn't eventually go to 0. And that would be associated with a system that's not stable because you can have some initial energy in the system and the output can become unbounded. For d to the n to decay, the magnitude of d has to be less than 1. And if I choose d equal 0.95, I get this decaying exponential. Starts at 1, goes to 0. And if I choose d equal to 0.7, then I get an exponential that decays considerably faster than the case for d equal 0.95. So the magnitude of d tells us how fast this term d to the n is going to decay. Now here I've taken the case where d is real, but it has a negative sign in front of it. It's a negative real number. In that case, when I raise d to the n, it alternates in sign. So you can see that I've got plus sign, minus, plus, minus, and I still have the same exponential taper of 0.95 to the n. And likewise with negative 0.7, it decays more quickly, but also alternates in sign because of the minus sign. Now when D is complex, and I'm going to choose to represent D here in terms of a polar formulation, so I've got the magnitude of D is 0.95, and the phase of D is pi divided by 11. And if I look at the real part of D to the n, it's going to be have an exponential taper 0.95 to the n, and then I'll have cosine of pi 11 times n, and so I get a exponentially decaying cosine, and the taper is 0.95, and then in the imaginary part I have the sine, so I have the same exponential decay of 0.95 to the n, and then I have a sine function that's oscillating at the frequency corresponding to this phase. So if this phase is close to zero, then the oscillation will be fairly slow, as the phase gets farther away from zero and closer to pi, the oscillation is going to be more rapid. So here's a case where I've changed both the magnitude and the phase. Note that I'm only showing 40 samples here rather than the 80 that we had here. And our envelope now, the amplitude decay is 0.7 to the n, so it follows this more rapid decay. And then our frequency of our cosine and our sine terms are pi over 3 now, which is about three times that of pi over 11, and you can see that this oscillates much more quickly than the pi over 11 case did. If the magnitude of D is close to 1, then these terms that we get, whether it's real or complex, are going to take quite a while to decay, whereas if the magnitude of D is close to 0, they're going to decay very quickly. We're going to look at a couple examples here of solutions to difference equations where we break the solution up into its steady state and transient component. And for simplicity, we're just going to assume that our input is x of n is a step u of n, so it turns on at time 0. And we'll assume the initial conditions at time 0 are all 0 as well. So on the left here, I'm going to show this first order difference equation which has a root at 0.95, 
this is the root of the characteristic equation. And if we solve this equation, and I happen to solve these in MATLAB, we get that the output, when we're initially at rest, the out output's going to grow in an exponential fashion toward the steady state value. And since the input signal is a step, which is a constant once we get away from n equals zero, we know that the output's going to approach a constant. And indeed, it does approach a constant here. Here's my steady state component, which is just 20. And then the transient is 0.95 to the n shape. And that tells us how it gets from the initial state of being at rest to the final state of approaching 20 for its output amplitude. Now we're going to look at a second order equation, because with a second order system, I can have characteristic equation, which has complex roots. And in this example I've shown down here, I've chosen the roots to be at 0.95 e to the plus or minus j pi over 11. Now my coefficients a1 and a2 are real, and so that results in a characteristic equation that has real coefficients, and therefore the roots of that equation occur in complex conjugate pairs. So I have one at plus j pi over 11, the other at minus j pi over 11 for phase angle. The response of the system as a whole oscillates some, and then it settles down at a constant level. And if we pull apart the steady state term, we see it's this constant value here. And then I look at the transient which response, which is what I add to this to get the axial response of the system. We see that it has this frequency of pi over 11, and it decays as 0.95 to the n because it involves these roots raised to powers. Here's a case where we've changed the location of the roots for the second order system. I put them at plus or minus j pi over 3. We've increased the frequency of the oscillation. And you see it has the same 0.95 to the n taper. But now it oscillates much more frequently because the terms in the transient response involve frequency pi over 3. We can move the roots again, and this time I put them at 0.7 e to the plus or minus j pi over 3. So I would expect the oscillations in this case, which are associated with the phase of the root, to have the same frequency as they did in the previous case. But I now have a root whose magnitude is closer to zero, and thus the response should decay more quickly. And indeed, you can see that's the case, is that the transient response decays to zero, fairly quickly because we're looking at 0.7 raised to the n in contrast to 0.95 raised to the n in the previous example. So the locations of the roots of the characteristic equation, principally their magnitudes and their phases, tell us a lot about the transient response of the system. And of course the steady state response, as we've discussed, tends to have the same form as the input once we get far enough away from by knowing these facts, you can determine a lot about the behavior of a system simply by looking at the difference equation description for that system.